Okay, so it's five o'clock, so let's let's start, shall we? So I'd like to offer a warm welcome to everyone who's joined us for this event. It's organised by SOAS, by the Centre of African Studies and by the Almas Art Foundation. I'm Polly Savage, I'm the lecturer in the Art History of Africa, and I'm delighted to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr Lillian Nabalime. Um, trained at the Margaret Trowell School of Industrial and Fine Art at Makerere University in Kampala, uh, Lillian Nabellini has, since the 1990s, built a diverse and compelling body of work that addresses social pressures at the intersections of gender, health and community in Uganda. She says of her work, my work uses ordinary objects, for example, soap, sieves, cloth, mirror, metal cans, car metal parts, found objects to embody a specific social agenda, agenda namely disease, gender issues, environment, that attempts to raise awareness and promote discussion, as well as moving the meaning of art beyond the visual. In 2007, uh, Lillian was awarded her PhD by Newcastle University with a dis dissertation on the role of sculptural forms as a communication tool in relation to the lives and experiences of women with HIV AIDS in Uganda. She's now a senior lecturer at the School of Industrial and Fine Arts at Makerere University in Kampala, where she was formerly the head of the sculpture department. Um, I had the great privilege of working with Lillian back in 2021 on the commission for a research collaboration between the SOAS School of Arts and London School of Economics on health knowledge uh, and autonomy in relation to infectious diseases in East and Southern Africa. Uh, and she has a very active practice. Her current exhibition, uh, Embodying Social Being, opens tomorrow night at Somerset House and runs until the 23rd of April. And I think the curator Basat Kamen will say a little bit more about that at the end of the event, but do go along um, and see that while it's there. Um, I'd also like to welcome and say thank you to our discussant for this evening, uh, Martha Kazungu. Martha's a Ugandan curator and art historian and writer living and working between Nairobi and Kampala. She's the founder of the Najabala Foundation and not profit not-for-profit organisation facilitating visibility for, women's arti for women artists. Uh, she holds a master's degree in African visual and verbal art with a focus on curating from the University of Bayreuth. And she's currently a consultant for the Nairobi Contemporary Arts Institute and the German Federal Cultural Foundation. She's published and curated widely. So many thanks to you both for being here tonight. Uh, the plan is that uh, Lillian and Martha will speak for approximately uh, an hour and then we will open up to questions so please if you do have any questions add them to the chat and we will respond to as many as we can and then as I said Basak will say a word or two to close about Lillian's exhibition so thank you both so much for being here and I'll, I'll hand over to Martha and Lillian. Thank you. Thank you, Polly. Yeah, as I've been introduced, I'm Dr. Lillian Nabalime, senior lecturer at the School of Fine Art. I have a bachelor's degree, diploma in education, and a master's from this uh, from Mackay University and the PhD at the University of Newcastle. And the sculptures now I'm, I'm showing are the sculptures which I did for my masters, developing sculptural forms from tree roots, that is crucifixion. And that was Kavuyo. And this, uh, when I was enrolling for my masters, I had thought I'd do on women, but then I realized many people had worked on women. And then the former um, Sam Guatam said, why don't you work on roots? And then one day it, uh, there was a heavy rainstorm. And then I would see what happened, the real roots. And then I could cut them and then bring them into the School of Fine Arts studio on two tracks to the space and worked on them. That is Kavuyo. By that time I was making it, Uganda had a lot of wars and I was seeing reptiles running from each other. For me, those were just 
um, symbolism of chaos and unrest during that time. Then uh, there's also this one, Ancestors, which is also a personal collection. This one, I could see forms which were not existing. That's why I called it Ancestors. And then after my master's, after my master's, I had a chance to go to Austria for a residency. And then I realized I was supposed to develop, to make a sculpture, a big sculpture, like maybe four feet in 10 days. And when I looked at that log, I said, no, I have never worked on this in nine days, in 10 days. But then by that time I traveled with the late uh, Fabu, Fabu just encouraged me and said, Lillian, you can do it. Indeed, when you have the encouragement, you do it. So I was able to develop, uh, to make a sculpture in 10 days. And when I returned, I wondered, because there we had used power tools. And I, when I was doing my master's, I never used power tools. I was using hand tools. And when I walked into the our studio in the department, there were power tools. I said, oh God, my professor didn't expose me to power tools. But maybe that also taught me to have patience when, when I'm working in wood carving. And then later on, because of the experience of working with, with roots, I can work on, on any form of wood. Other materials which people discard, I take them on. I know like these are like poles. And then I was making wonderful sculptures to elongated women. And basically, I look at women that are beautiful. Women should not despise themselves. That is what Namuli and Namakula was meant, were meant to be. And I'm back into my studios working, using the power tools and the hand tools that there. And that is the, uh, the piece after finishing it, I was loading it to, in, to the School of Fine Art Gallery. We had to create a trolley, it was quite huge. And I call it an angel. And that is tree from roots. So I keep on going back to the roots. So that was a screen made of uh, from a Motuba tree. And I had incorporated metal. I add metals to beautify and sometimes to hold this the wood together because wood cracks. After developing sculptures for a while, I uh, remember 1995, I went to the Johannesburg Bernali and then I met uh, an artist uh, called the, the, uh, Rashid Diab, and then that's where I had the interest to do a PhD. But I wanted a practice-based PhD, and the opportunity I got was in 2000. And then 1998, that's when I also had a, an issue. My husband, the late husband, was living with HIV AIDS, and it was such a trying moment. I had to to take up, no, really, I had to take to get down, get away from headship because it was too much pressure. And that time, you could not talk about HIV AIDS, how it was affecting you. And there are these assumptions that when you have a couple, both of you have. And fortunately, I didn't have. Because of exhaustion, I told Edward, I need a break. And then one my colleague of mine told me, do your PhD. And 2001, I ended up in Newcastle. I don't know why, but it was the best place for me. And when we gender and HIV AIDS, HIV AIDS is a women's issue. Women's vulnerability are higher because of the patriarchy, the main role, customized practices, female circumcision, sexual abuse, poverty, so forth. Most women, women living with HIV AIDS have their relationship life with endangered when their partners learn their HIV AIDS positive, which is true. And then I decided, when I read, when I got a book from the University of Newcastle, I decided, mm, let me read about HIV AIDS. That's when I realized I'd been affected. I didn't live with HIV AIDS, but because Edward was sick, I was traumatized. And then I said, mm, now, let me develop sculptures for HIV AIDS awareness. The aim is to study the lives and experiences of women living with HIV AIDS to inform ideas of sculpture work to communicate HIV AIDS awareness among Uganda women. To develop sculptures that can transcend the illiterate, literate 
divide the enriched numeric ethnic groups in Uganda, process the use of sculpture to break down taboos and facilitate discussion on HIV AIDS and its prevention among both men and women. The practice was informed by life experiences of women who are living with disease and my personal experience of caring of people living with HIV AIDS. I was also informed by literature about HIV AIDS and factors rendering women vulnerable to infection in order to stimulate ideas which could inform sculpture. Sculpture in, in the 20th century, social sculpture and moving beyond aesthetic to bring about social transformation, looking at uh, artists like boys and others. And one, some of the pieces I made, this was the, uh, the first sculpture I made relating on my ex personal experience portraits. I made the first sculpture, which is which looks very disfigured. And because of the weather in the UK, it came out rotten and falling apart. And I said, I wondered. So it, I just needed to walk around um, he hit so that the other sculpture could get, uh, so I produced another one and then it was better. It had, so it is paper mache and back cloth. So when I brought the two to kissing, that is love and care for people living with HIV AIDS. And then I also reflected on that, my personal experience with Edward and our daughter. We had had friends, but when Edward was diagnosed in 1998, I remember we, he introduced me to his, to my, I introduced him to my parents. Many people turned up asking Edward, are you sure those are your true friends? I said, yes. Yes, but then at the end of the year, he was sick and they all disappeared. During the four years I was in Uganda at that time, none of, many of them had disappeared far away from us. And we were usually the three of us, me, him, and our daughter. So compassion and support for people living or affected with the HIV AIDS, that was the message in that wood carving. And when I kept on working and then because I'm a social, I'm, I'm an artist, I'm not a social worker. My supervisors found, her, found it hard, but I had to insist and I told them, this is the subject matter I want to work on. And then when I started rolling, but they were good. They just let me do what I want and they were supervised. So I remember the book, then they said, Lillian, you have to go for a pilot project. And I went for a pilot project in London with an organization called IVO. And I remember going there and then the woman asked, why are you doing HIV AIDS? My, my husband is sick and many of my relatives are sick and they are dying, they are dying. He said, hmm. Then, I, then she said, okay. She accepted, you can work with us. And after interviewing the women, I, this is one of the sculptures. So, um, and that time of 2003, the female condom had come on market. And I remember making the, uh, uh, the, the motor and the, uh, the motor and the, and the peso. So the peso is the man and the motor is the woman. And that time the, the female condom had come on market. And so I had to nail the metal pieces inside the motor. That took me time, like three years, three months, nailing. And then after I said, ooh, fantastic, this is a very good sculpture. And then I also interpreted the women. The women were telling me that the women in London, the African women and somewhere Uganda, and they were telling me that they had come to the UK and they felt good, but they were still burdened by the disease. And I could show the disease by the nails and the power cuts. And the red lips, the, the, of course, women want to look beautiful, adorn their hair, but they were still living with the HIV AIDS. And then those, most of them were in, in the UK, were burdened by the, uh, their relatives in Africa. So those that are the lobes which are below that piece, struggle to live. And then I kept on producing more work, like, because I asked these women, do you talk openly to your children about HIV AIDS? And the women said, no. I said, why? You feel so embarrassed. That's what they say. Then I made these bowls and I said, well, then I, I, when I went to the studios and reflected, I said, yeah, we should use, I should use objects in the house 
to facilitate discussion. So I made these balls and casted the number of them. And uh, the material also had to be meaningful. I used scream, which is a natural material to represent the body. And then I had all those balls around. And some I was putting nails and colors, disease. And then one is, has uh, lattice, the condom use. So, and then some of them were telling me that they don't want any sex. So the, the balls are upside down, abstinence. And then also that brought me a reminder that not all the uh, condoms in Africa, because I've had these experiences, you are there in action and and the, uh, 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 and the condom busts. So then I continue like winnowing. And these were culture. Uh, in my culture, the Baganda, we also do winnowing, uh, separating the grain from the chaff, but I was also relating it to HIV AIDS. Uh, women, the, the ability of women to, to, to take a choice, to choose their life, uh, their partners, if they have, if they can. And I remember some of these, the women were telling me that they were enjoying sex. So some of them represent the nails, the women infected. And then I was covering it with latex. I said, oh, if you're enjoying sex and you're having HIV AIDS, please use protection, protect your partner. And then you are telling uh, the current shells, that relates to money because some of them say, oh, we are into prostitution. I said, yes. And then I said, well, if you're into prostitution, please use protection. So those are the issues, the lives about the women who I had interviewed. Some didn't even have education and and then because HIV AIDS is such a scary subject, I had to, uh, to make beautiful sculptures. And this one, where it holds, that is the most uh, precious part of the woman, which should be protected if the woman has a, ch a chance. And then all those sculptures you've seen, I look, I analyzed them and then I, I, I looked at them, or I analyzed them, they were, they had issues. One, the question, the reflections from the women, the women had, uh, when I asked, had asked them a question, would you like more HIV AIDS awareness? The Ugandan women in, in, in London said no, because their lives, they had moved on. They are tired of the HIV AIDS information. And then still working in Newcastle, the British girls or, and boys, well, and some of them, I, I, I was studying with, didn't know what oh, some of these sculptures I was making because they were embedded with the traditional forms and messages of African. So I say, I thought, oh, well, my sculptures can communicate more to the Uganda women back home in Uganda, and especially those who are less educated. That's what, that's where my, my thoughts. And then taking pictures of the works of the sculptures, some of the sculptures. And I remember going back to Kampala and I had two organizations of women living with HIV AIDS, Nakola and Rimbuya Reach Out. And I asked these women, uh, has H uh, sculpture been used for HIV AIDS awareness? The women said, no. I said, what? Well, we don't know what even sculpture is all about. Because not, not arts, fine art is not offered in many schools in, in Uganda. Then I went to the organizations, 11 of them, and asked, why are you not using H uh, uh, sculptures for HIV AIDS awareness? They said, Lydia, your sculptures are big. You cannot easily take them to the, to the villages. And I asked, what kind of sculptures would you want? Then they told me, Sculptures, small sculptures, which are easily much liable, easy to take, which can engage discussions about HIV AIDS. I said, okay. And then I realized that three years in the UK developing these sculptures was, was like, it didn't mean much. And then before I returned to the UK at that time, I asked my mother, what kind of soft, uh, sculptures should I make? No. Well, I just asked her, what materials? And then she said, I said, what is the online material Uganda use every? She said, so. I didn't think much about it, but returning to the UK, when I was making developing sculptures, and then I said, no. I realized sculptures had to be casted. And then I also thought seriously that sculptures, most of the infections of our Ugandans at that time was through heterosexual. 
So the male and the female vagina are the source. So I developed sperms, and then later on, because they were literal, then my supervisor went, laughed at me and said, who did it? Who, who will accept that kind of sculpture? So then I had to make them in abstract. And then I had to look for soap because I remember soap has symbolism, washing, cleaning. If you are cleaning, then that means you are, you, your life. Uh, if you're sick, you're going to hospital. That's what I thought. And then when I also worked with the transparent soap, it was interesting. I could embed objects into them. Yeah, clear soap with the curry shell to emphasize the female form, organ. The soap sculptures group, we are a family. We don't know who has HIV AIDS. And then I had to return to Uganda carrying my soap sculptures. And then I presented the sculptures to the women who are living with HIV AIDS. And then they picked them up. I didn't say anything, I just picked them because my one of my colleagues had warned me, what will our people say when you're bringing those penises and vaginas to them? I told him, you know, this is the only sculpture I have for HIV AIDS awareness. And when I presented them to my separate, these local people who are not so highly educated, pick them and we are laughing. So I had also a, a group discussion. And then when we had one of these discussion of men and women, and then one of them, the lady who challenged me, how can we talk about penises and vaginas publicly and HIV AIDS? And then I thought first, I asked her how many times have our relatives defiled us and we don't say anything and they are passing the disease on us. This high time we talk about this disease openly and how it is affecting us. And amazingly, the group and others also uh, accepted and were able to discuss HIV openly. And I had focused also on women, but during my, my trials of the soft sculptures, the men came to me and said, don't leave us behind. I said, but this research is for the women. They said, no, 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 you can't leave it behind. But I realized that the men had more issues regarding HIV AIDS and HIV infection. They were more open, yet the women were less. And then I realized that people get infections because we don't talk op openly about our disease. And then surprising these women could talk openly how the disease had infected them. And then I asked them, mm -hmm, what if the uh, if the soap is clear? I said, yeah, that has no HIV AIDS or somebody is on treatment. So these were people who were less educated, but they could, could interpret the soap sculptures so well. And my, my supervisors at that time had told me, Lillian, if your research had put me at test, uh, if your research is communicating HIV AIDS, bring evidence. At that time, Edward was leaving and I said, how can I go publicly and tell the world that Edward is living with HIV AIDS? But I remember when I had brought the soft sculptures, you were on the table, when he was about to die, he just went, opened up and said, can you help Lillian? Can you help her with our research? And that was the moment to realize that Edward has accepted uh, to develop sculptures on HIV AIDS. So it was okay with him. So when he passed, I continued with my research. And fortunately that time, when we had the focus group discussion, I was able to take the journalist to record the story. And that was the evidence for my supervisors in the UK. At as a social practice, I've had some journals contributed and one at, as a social practice, transforming lives with using sculpture. That was with me and my, one of the supervisors after the PhD, Shara, which one, Shara University. And yeah. So to, I, I, when I returned, I kept on developing sculptures as act as a social practice. Uh, so we had this COVID 
it affected me. It got me. I almost died. And then when, through my recovery, I started developing small sculptures on, on COVID, the masks. And then I also had to bring in humor because people you could not talk about uh, that you have uh, you have COVID. I also was able to develop more sculptures after my recovery, metal castings, that is like one foot. And then what Polly didn't know by that time when I responded to her call, I was very sick. And I just decided to take on her call for recovery. So there I was working also on Bilhazia. So the chat, the, 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 it, it was because Bilhazia affects people who are around their legs. And then I realized that or when, I, when I studied about the disease, that people get it when they go, when they go to get water into the legs. That is the jerry can. And the disease deposits itself in the stomach. So people who are living with, uh, oh gosh. People who are living with Bilhazia have the, their intestines fully bloated with the disease and below are the snails. So it was really telling this story through this sculpture. And then on the other side is the gambos that suggesting that if they use boots when they are drawing water, then they might not get the, the, the Bilhazia. At the same, same time, those who have uh, proper hygiene is also paramount for Bilhazia. Ah, and then. I've also developed sculptures commissions. For example, that one uh, was done in Denmark. I traveled to Denmark to make that piece in, in one month. And now I have, of course, I'm here at the Somerset. But the works which are being shown in, in the Somerset exhibition are sculptures, some of like the unity. Uh, these are wooden sculptures which were developed uh, for the Devonshire Building, University of Newcastle. It happened at that time, two, 2004, they had, the university was felling trees, and I passed by and I had the courage to ask for the logs. And then these guys told me, Can you bring your, the estate manager, Nick Paddy, said, Can you bring your for portfolio? I brought it. And then before I knew it, they had brought 10 logs, huge logs to the department. Then after the Nick party comes back and said, Oli, can you make a, we want to commission to, to do some work. We never negotiated anything, any money. And I made the um, Marquez models for them and they accepted. So later on, I was able to develop the sculptures here and they are in the show. Uh, unity, I call it unity because I realized while I was doing that, those captures, those captures, uh, the, the only, what, after the building, oh, sorry, after the building had, uh, had finished, they invited me to go walk around the building and to, sh uh, to pick a space where the, uh, the sculptures would be. And I told, uh, I realized that beyond the entry, beyond the reception, it is only the scientists who are working on the environments who have access. Then I just said, oh, I have my buildings at the front. And they gave me that opportunity. I was very happy. <laughs> so then later on, I, uh, of course, those sculptures are there. I'm happy. <clears throat> but then I also had, yeah, yeah, those are the sculptures and the Devon share. And I'm grateful to Andrew Barton because he was able to, <laughs> to organize for them, as well as the Amas Foundation to bring them back, to bring them down to London. And then I also had a postdoctor uh, by the Royal, uh, Royal Overseas at that time, when I just finished my master's. I produced sculptures, which I exhibited at Oxo Gallery. So these sculptures have been in the in Newcastle, and I had this opportunity to show. I've had this opportunity to show them again. That is twist. I look at twists. It was uh, for me. It is like the experiences I've gone through. Life is not a straight journey. I've had challenges. So. 
And that is the twist in my life. But even other women go through a lot of hassles and a chain to hold me to get it. Was called, I was using it to hold it, to hold the sculpture so that it couldn't crack. But the ability of women to be strong, to overcome their challenges when, if, if they have the chance. And then at that time, I also produced, because when I did my PhD, I also realized that I had not developed sculptures for children, for HIV AIDS awareness. But then I realized that it's the parents who should be more mindful. So at that time, I used the key. The key is a symbolism that like people, the parents should be mindful about the lives of their children. And they are, of course, I've been using recycled materials. Uh, and they use engaging the children into, it is engaging the children into HIV AIDS awareness, but at the same time, it is the parents who, are, who should be very mindful about their sexual lives and if they're sick to go for treatment so that they can live for their children. So the current work, some of the current work I'm working on, which I was, I was, I was able to bring, uh, the, <clears throat> it's about rumors, gossip. It is clear. Why rumors? Because it reminds me of, of the so many, like, uh, for example, when Edward lives, many people were able to, were talking and we never came out to help us, to, to help us through this HIV AIDS at that time. But through the research, the greatness about the research, I remember asking the women, why are you so open about your lives? Then they say, if we talk openly about our lives and how it has affected us with the disease, there's no rugamo, there's no rumor mongering. So that I learned to be open at all issues which happened to me. The rumor mongers, the soap sculptures at the exhibition, and at the moment, I have the Lisha Gallery, it's the project which I've been running on from 2020. 2020, before COVID, I was supposed to have an exhibition. Martha was the curator. I realized I didn't have, the gallery space had been taken away. And then I told Martha, Martha, look for a space where I have to exhibit this exhibition. It was a joint exhibition and we had it in the museum. While I was carrying my, my sculptures to the museum, I said, this should be the last time I'm carrying these heavy sculptures. I have land in Chanja where, where I should do, where I can have uh, create space for working and even exhibit. I thought I was going to come up with a small room. And then one of my colleagues said, but Dr. Lilian, today you don't have the money, but what if one day you have money and then you have constructed a small uh, building, uh, a small room for your sculptures. Uh, fortunately, amazingly, Martha gave me uh, something like $300, which is um, me, 1 million Uganda shillings. And then the other guy, Sewanyana, gave me 300. And then I had the courage, and I had 1 million. We started off the foundation for my gallery at Chanja. So for me, the Chanja, I know I've worked a lot, for almost the 30 years. I'm going, December will be a high, I'll be on floor six, I'll be 60. And I said, oh my God, this changer, I have to make sure that I have the time to work more on, I would like to work more on my sculptures. And I, re I reflect on the number, the way I have had time to work on, on sculpture without any disturbance, that is when I was developing my master's and then the PhD experience, and even the time I have in, in the international residence. But when I'm teaching at, at the university, I find it hard to produce the same amount of work, which is as meaningful as I had at that time. Of course, I develop. So I believe Chanja, whatever happens, I don't know. If I have enough resources, I need that space to display, produce sculptures continuity to develop sculptures that contribute to society, an experience of sculpture, residency, workshops, focusing on working with the youth, lover, lovers of sculpture and the community on both local and international. That is my house. It has taken me 
time because Lucy, this is the land we had with Edward. So his passing, I realized that for him, it was a, a, a grand house for us and for the family. And I realized I didn't want it anymore because I had lost him. My daughter has grown. So what I need is space for to do my sculptures. I have seven rooms, which are self-contained. Uh, it has taken me some years, but so these are the rooms, self-contained, but they are not furnished. And that is the gallery space. That is outside the relief sculptures. And that is the space. And if I have more money, then I can do more. We can I can put on raise more space for 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 the artwork. Of course, I have too much work. It doesn't even fit. Much of it is in, still in boxes. But at least I have a space where somebody can come and look at the work. That is my gallery. So I'm happy that I've been able to make it, and I've taken loans. And that is the space, some of the youth coming to enjoy the sculptures. I've not opened it yet because the gallery, of course I have the space, but there's still a lot which I need to work on. That is the space. And then there is Martha. I think a year ago, Martha gave me an opportunity. I said, Lillian, we are having a, a, an international exhibition, no, curator's workshop. Uh, can we use your rooms? I told her, Martha, the rooms are there, but I don't have, uh, they, they are no beds. She said, can you look for money? I told her, Martha, I tried my best. I have a loan. I can't get more money from the bank. All she said, okay, we can take your space and only for the workshop. But the participant will have to reside elsewhere. I said, well, that was good enough. So with the money Martha raised, I was able to create, so I can hold workshops in the space. And I also, I can hold workshops. I can just remove the sculptures, create workshops for meetings, whatever. But then after I have my gallery, that is my space. I still need to work on it. But when you are alone, it is a struggle because many people come to me and say, oh, but Lillian, you've never finished. I said, yes, I'm, a, I'm single. I'm, I'm struggling. But the little I have is what I can produce. So I believe at least at the end of the year, I have seven rooms, but I have I will have two rooms, my space, and any other person who would like to visit me and it won't work. Ah, so I had a group of women, and uh, these were women on civic education. I facilitated a workshop with them how to develop, uh, develop sculptures for the civic. The civic issues are many, which also includes health, health social issues. And then at the end, they, decide, they asked me to come and visit my space. And here they were, enjoying the space and the sculptures. So I'm gratitude to Amas Foundation for organizing the showcase and publishing the book and, my, and make it, make, make enable me to be here in London to share you my some of my experiences. Thank you. Um, Lillian, um, a huge thank you for this wonderful journey you've taken us through through your career um, in such a kind of sensitive and honest way. Thank you so much. Um, it's been so enlightening to see how your work has developed over time and how um, how you address all of these really important concerns around health and the body and the sort of way that society uh, exercises pressure on women's bodies in particular. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll hand over to Martha. I don't want to say too much because we've invited Martha to respond to, to Lillian's talk. So um, I'll, I'll hand over to Martha for um, for her comments and questions uh, before we open it up to the wider audience. Uh, Martha, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Polly. Uh, it was really nice listening to you, Dr. Lillian. Um, of course, many of the things you've said, uh, I have heard from you as my professor at the University of, of, of Margaret, at the Makere University, um, where I did my first degree a couple of years ago. 
and so many other things we have inter interacted on on different professional and non-professional levels it's very heartwarming to also hear you um, speak about everything in, in a few minutes um and of course your work goes a long way but a lot of it is influenced and really informed by your personal experiences and i think it's a very brave um, aspect of your work that you're able to narrate <laughs> or with all honesty you know has life has happened to you and your family and your close loved ones and even have that then transcend and get featured within within your artistic practice um as you were speaking a few things were uh, more and more clearer and i thought you could maybe speak a bit um in detail about them i was struck by the aspect of time um, because some, in some cases you insisted that you know you had a deadline of 10 days for example and in some cases you had you know seven years or three months to do something and i wanted um, you to kind of speak to us about you know the time aspect in your process of making art is it that does it influence to a large extent what comes out in the process or it is always has to be you know, influenced by whoever is the commissioner for, for whatever you're, you're doing? Mm, it depends on two aspects. If it is the commission, for example, you saw the work, if it is a commission, they have deadlines. And residences also have deadlines. But it all depends. And if it is academics, they also have their deadlines. But when it is academic, like the masters, and the PhD, the master's was like two years, developing a body of work in two years. The PhD was developing work in a period, it would have been four. Yeah, no, it was supposed to be three years, four, but Edward's death made it longer because I had to overcome the grief and the loss. So, but then what? I enjoyed most during when developing the sculptures for the masters and the HIV AIDS, I had time only to concentrate on the work. And then that means, and the PhD was excellent because I could read, I could go to the galleries and look at other artists, how they had worked on HIV AIDS. I could make references and I enjoyed looking, in fact, I enjoyed my PhD. I could move to galleries. I would see the work of uh, uh, Felix Gonzalez was one of my best. And you know, he would use ordinary materials to express HIV AIDS. Like for example, the streets. I went into this gallery and I was seeing streets and they were telling me, eat as much as you want. I picked and enjoyed. And then as I come up, they said, oh, that is how the disease is destroying my body. I said, oh my God. <laughs> he engages you in, you eat, then after he tells, telling you how the disease was affecting his life, the loss of weight. So there was a lot to learn. But then when you are busy here teaching, you don't have time to read and go, even go to galleries. But in Uganda, we are, have limited, we are limited. So the, the, the opportunity I had in Newcastle was amazing. I loved what I was doing. I think that's why I, did. I was able to come up with powerful works. And in fact, teaching as well as producing is also has a limit. I remember one, one day I produced, I, I wanted to produce more sculptures on HIV. And my colleague, one of my colleagues was very upset with me. He said, oh, you, you, the work you produced in Newcastle was too powerful. What he didn't realize that I didn't have that time to sit down and produce more work. And those are the challenges we go through, I have gone through. But if it is a commission, of course, when it, when it is a commission, like the, there's a big sculpture I was standing and then there was a gentleman. He took, he paid for me to go to, uh, to go to Denmark, produce that work in one month. And I would take time, reflect, it was at the sea, I could go and enjoy the sea. In fact, the guy at one time panicked and said, but Lydia, when will you ever finish my work? I told him, don't worry, I'll finish it. 
And because he had given me a, a space, I was happy. After within one month, I had developed a huge peace for him. So it's the time, the facilities. I think some of us, some of the students felt, in fact, as I've seen it with my students as well. When they are not facilitated, it's very hard to come up with good work. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor, um, for, for answering that elaboratively. The other question I had was um, mm. about the amount of symbolism in your work. Mm. So uh, in my essay, in, in your book, in your first monograph, I, I quote mm. what the art historian, the late Sidney Kasper said that Uganda, despite having one of the oldest art schools in, in Eastern and Central Africa, Mm. stays behind the radar of you know international collectors and mm. basically behind major major mainstream media in the art mm. and she was explaining this giving different reasons but one of them saying that the artists are so engraved in the local or traditional symbolisms mm. that people from other places cannot relate um, to to them you know, mm -hmm. she was mostly speaking about even the Buganda or the Buganda culture traditions. And also in by extension in your work, there is, um, as you're explaining how there was a disconnect between what the Ugandans in the UK could relate to, to the Ugandans uh, back on ground and all the back and forth in your research mm -hmm. processes. I wonder for you, does it, is it is it a worry at any point when you when you're having all the symbolisms in your work that it it can be understood or for you the it is about the the theme or the idea you want to put across that transcends all those barriers? Uh -huh. When you are producing work, what I realized about the PhD is that you develop a body of work. So. Who, in fact, now when I'm making work, who, who benefits from the work? In fact, I also keep on the, asking the students, who benefits from the work? So that means if it is to benefit the people, you have to put it on test. And for me, I developed the work at that time and took it to the people. Fortunately, they were able to relate to it and respond, but I never engaged them into the work into developing, into the making of the work. Huh? So I still have, I feel that if I have time, if I have resources, I would like to, to work again, continue working with HIV AIDS issues, as well as involving people and see what their thoughts would be, what ideas they can come up with. So it is a two way, it all depends on the time frame and even the people who you are working with or what you want to pass on. For example, like the soap sculptures, eh? I was excited about the soap sculptures and how, <clears throat> and how people were able to relate to them and their disease. But I could not continue with the soap sculptures because the soap material is not produced in Uganda. And after that, I realized, oh my God, this is a big mess. Because I had even taken the efforts to register the soft sculpture and they were meant for the women so that I could massively produce them and then they would help them, they would sell them and overcome their poverty. But the soft material can't, can't be used. So I need to sit there, maybe I'll have Finding after my after after this after sixty and and start continuing the HIV AIDS. <laughs> oh God! Okay. All right. So I'm coming close to the end of my questions. Uh, the maybe second last or last, depending on mm. on how we're doing with time. Um, is is really about your personal experience. So as you've taken us through almost, I think 90% of your work mm -hmm. originates from a personal experience, you know, from, you know, losing your husband early to even now the work, the, the recent work you just talked us, told us about the rumor mongering is, 
you know, kind of has a backdrop to that experience. Um, I, I wonder in this, in the progress of now establishing a permanent building in Chanja to also address social, social, um, social, you know, problems of, of Uganda being one of the youngest countries in the world with, you know, 30%, no more than, you know, more than 50% people below 30. Mm -hmm. I, um, is this, do you feel the, um, do you feel the obligation to intervene on a personal level or is this, this something that just happens organically um, within your life as a generous person or as a, like where do you draw all this inspiration to do all the things that you're doing? Mm. Uh, I think maybe I, I have to, I think I should say that I was sometimes I think that uh, I'm a, I'm still alive for a reason. Go if God may spared me for a reason, and then I know that whatever I do should benefit people, humanity. The word has been, of course, I've been, I've got a lot of support, especially when, 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 as I, I've moved on. And then I say that I also should also give back to others. So mm -hmm. I should also support others through my art, through education, and through teaching. I don't know if I have ans answered you well. Mm, kind of, but you know, the in 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 the, mm. in a world of a developing country like the one we live in in Uganda, mm. Mm. there are so many challenges. Oh. on a personal level from you know unemployment to disease and lack of hospitals and infrastructure mm. there are so many possibilities for an artist you know to to intervene and yet um throughout these 30 years as you explained you you're very passionate about the time you spent in your castle because it also allowed you the space and time to work um Mm. you know on this topic with without any rush or without any constraint mm. you know and yet even when you leave this Newcastle setting back to Uganda you continue to be inspired by addressing this kind of of social social I don't know problems mm. and, and so my question was towards that is it like a personal obligation that you feel or is it something that just happens um, for for you very organically. Maybe that question is mostly also about, you know, like how do you, like what's what sets the pace for you um, in, in your practice? And maybe it should go back to like process, like where do you start? Is it, do you, do you, because for so many women artists, you talk about how you also wanted to address the, the woman in your work. Is it, is it an obligation you feel, or is it something that just happens organically in your in your practice? Hmm. Yeah, maybe. Is it organically? No, I know that whatever I produce, whatever affects me, comes through into my work. It is a personal experience or how to address issues that are affecting me. But at the same time, I realized that I'm not alone. Others are also affected. Mm -hmm. So I produce, so I, I just continue developing uh, because the Lugambo, Lugambo is not only about me. Lugambo is, uh, for example, I don't know enough in Uganda, the, or well, in my community, there's so much Lugambo. Lugambo is bad for us because people talk about you and they don't come to help you. And then you are struggling and we've lost so many people. We lost so many people in HIV AIDS just because people did not want, well, of course, the stigma and what have you. And they realized, for example, I had a friend who, who worked in the city castle and were HIV AIDS treatment. And when I went, I told him, you know, we, ha we, we have this issue of HIV, you say, Namanya, that I knew. He knew. So they were talking behind us. And I said, then he told me, the city castle had the drugs. I, I, I told him, really? Then I asked him, really? You kept quiet? And then he knew that there were antivirals which would help 
Fortunately, I didn't have HIV AIDS, but how many people were dying and yet the drugs are there? All we need is support for one another. So I know it touches me, but I know it also touches, whatever I do will also touch others in different ways. Yeah, maybe for the non Luganda speakers, Lugambo, Ms. Ruma Mongar. <laughs> so she was ref she referencing to that at work, which is one of the risk, most recent um, body of work, which is, I think, ongoing. Mm -hmm. and my, thank you, Martha. You have been a, a great support to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you, Martha, um, for this, this, your very kind of useful and thought provoking questions. Um, did you have any, did you have any further questions for Lillian or are we ready to open up for I, wider, wider? I think we are ready to open up and okay. should the audience be quiet, I could ask some more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the chat and um, I also would love to ask a question if there's time, but um, let's open it up now. So um, we have one from Alexandra. Um, so I'll read Alexandra's question. I can see somebody's also had a hand up and uh, I'd invite please all, all of the attendees to add your questions to the, the Q&A box that uh, you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so let's start with Alexandra's. Um, she says, uh, Dr. Nabulime, thank you so much for uh, your amazing presentation. I'm curious to ask, what do you think are the biggest challenges for African female artists on the contemporary art scene? Mm. We have this funny, for example, I teach girls and few continue practicing because they don't have the money, the sources. And many, when they get married, their husbands don't allow them. So me, I was just fortunate that the husband I had was supportive and he had interest in what I was doing. So he was willing at all times to be there. Whenever I would say something, hey, Edward, I want this. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I, and I was traveling a lot. Oh, Edward, there's this exhibition, there's this workshop. All he would do is just uh, say yes, and then he'd drive me to the airport and back. <laughs> Few husbands would ever allow their women to move to and fro like I did. And most of my friends were men because at that time it was more than men working. Eh? So I could relate with it easily with the men because I also had to make sure I wanted my to progress. So I'd work as them. And then all the male friends I had were Edward's friends. So I had the opportunity that my man accepted my friends and even whatever I wanted to do, but not all. So we in a, in a patriarch society where the man rules, so women find it hard. But eventually through education, I think men also re can, should realize that if you have a female artist and she's earning, then that means you have a mother at all, if she can do the work at all, as well as caring for the babies. That is also good about it. But funding is a uh, support for the women is really tough. And that is the reason why I have, I want my Chandia space. The ability, if I, I have a chance, I can, edu uh, in, because we have women who are finishing the edu uh, university education and they are not continuing. And this year, of course, over the years I've taught and I, I, I continue asking them, please, can you come, can you practice? And then they tell me, madam, we don't have the findings. We don't have the money. So if I have resources, I would invite them into my space and work with them so that they can improve on their profession and become uh, excellent in their production. Mm. Sorry, I was uh, Thank you, Lillian. Uh, both you and Martha are doing really active, kind of dynamic projects to support women artists at the moment. And I don't know if Martha, you'd like to add anything to that, to that answer, um, because I know obviously you're working with in this field as well. 
Yeah, I think we would need a whole talk on the challenges of women artists on the African <laughs> continent, to be honest, um, because Lillian just talked about, you know, what happens after marriage and which is one of the most <laughs> important aspects of an African woman, at least as a social construct, you know, marriage and, and family. And that has been, of course, a big um, challenge for many women artists that not only do they even lose their names upon marriage, they also lose their careers because it's just impossible mm. in, in many circumstances to, to do anything more. But um, beyond even just the marriage, you can talk about things like access to opportunities, even residencies and travel, because you know when you have a child or a mother, it's impossible suddenly to go anywhere and no one is willing to pay two flights <laughs> neither for accommodation nor for um yeah so it's uh the, the women artists face um, enormous challenges um mostly funding acceptance and and also because of the patriarchal systems in, in many african cities even when they are included in exhibitions they still excluded somehow because you find themselves either in the darkest place of the exhibition space or you know, in the less conspicuous space, in the exhibition space. So this is actually how the Njewala Foundation was, was launched, was, you know, to answer to these questions. And still, you know, in 2023, we are very much, um, I don't know, challenged, or asked why we even exist, because people are not willing to understand that women artists deserve um, the rights that men, male artists do. And that is first of all mental, but then it goes into small, small activities in the art world that just suffocate the work of women artists. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, Martha. Um, yeah, and thank you both for all the work that you do in this in this field. Um, I'll open it up to the next question, I think. Um, so we have a question from uh, Samuel Professor Kasule. Um, you asked, uh, maybe you know this right. the question a little. Um, he asks, how do you merge your original concept of roots with the current work on COVID and HIV? Mm, I think when I was developing those captures, they were huge. The roots are huge. And I remember not working with the part tools, so that means it, they trained trained me to be resilient, to be resilient to how should I say that I had to, I had the will to work on whatever it takes to finish to finish them. So that means when I'm when I get start, when I get started on a work, it has to I'll finish it whatever it takes. It would be, unless I'm sick or dead, but all my works, they can take sometimes a year, seven, but I, I finished them. I think it's the patience to concentrate and work and produce. Right, so sort of process um, and technique rather than the concept. I mean, would you say that the concept of roots is um something that you continued i devote the patience mm. to work mm. on on issues mm. and i think it's, it has also applied even with people with the time like edward i had to you know i you know of course the men bring the disease but that training i had the forgiveness it's, it is when you're working, you want to see things get better. <laughs> so for him, I because this man had was had a very good side of him. He encouraged me in many things. And when he fell sick, I said, I never judged him. I said, okay, this is an issue I have to handle. I cannot abandon him. And it was like he was a project as well. But it was a tough one. Yeah. Um, so the, the questioner says, 
um, where he's responded again, he says, but isn't Roots also at another level, a concept that allows you to draw from your indigenous sources and social contexts? So did you, I mean, did you understand your root sculptures in that sense, in the sense of a sort of being rooted in a landscape or in a culture? The roots. So, mm. uh, I beg your pardon? Um, I, th I think, um, so Samuel uh, Kasule is asking um, mm. if you'd like to expand on this, on, on the idea of roots being a concept that allows you to draw from your indigenous sources and social contexts, that's the terms that he uses. Um, would you like to speak on that? I mean, did you understand when you, for your root sculptures, did you understand them as kind of a reference to a connection to the to the earth, to the soil? Um, were you sort of exploring that that aspect? Well, I think when I was working with the roots, because these were discarded materials which were meant to be destroyed and burned, and that's what happens. Mm. But when I pick them, and then Uganda is losing a lot of its trees, its environment is being destructed, destroyed. And then like the roots, I was able to, to work on them. And then for me, when I, when I worked on them, it was re transforming them into beautiful forms, which are kept, which can be kept, which will bring source of income. It was generating income, no, forms that can be preserved for the future. Because some of the roots I have, the sculptures I have, I don't think we'll ever have a chance to have those such interesting sculptures if they uh the the forests are being erased because and then it shows you that roots as they grow they find around uh, a lot of obstacles in the ground so as we humans but then they go against them when they go against those uh, rocks then that means they become strong similar in fact now I'm relating it to my life experience that I've had hardships with people and then I don't confront them. I find how to maneuver around them. Similar, in fact, now it's like similar to what the roots do. So sometimes you do things unawarely, but now, in fact, now when we talk about the roots, it is the life experience I've gone through. So many obstacles, people stopping you going further. And then you can't confront them and say, why have you doing this? All I say, I take it in and I find another channel similar to the roots. They go beyond the borders and they come out as powerful. I mean, this device is quite um, common in your work of the twisted, um, of twisting, if you like. And you mentioned this. Um, and I thought that was a beautiful analogy for the kind of strength with which you approach the turns that life gives you um i thought that was a, a beautiful analogy and i suppose you could continue that into the analogy of a root you know giving you strength and grounding you yeah uh, through life's twists and turns um thank you Lillian. um we oh we have another question from uh chingi mudu ian chingi mudu um yeah <laughs> Hello. Okay. Um, your work is deeply rooted in the ethnography of the Baganda of central Uganda. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, Luganda is a euphemistic language and sex is rarely discussed in public. Mm -hmm. Considering that you deal with taboo subjects, mm -hmm. how have you been able to make Ugandan audiences receptive of your work? Are there scenarios that the sex symbols in your work have been criticised? Um, well... Uh, amazingly, no one has ever confronted me <laughs> about those penises and vagina. Amazingly, the priests, the clergy would have been the first people to say, or oh, you are embarrassing us. And remember when Edward had died, I had these soap sculptures. A priest came to my house and I just brought the box of soap sculptures and I presented to him. I just told him, this is my research. 
And the priest, all he told me, a Catholic priest, oh, these are beautiful things. I said, yeah. Then he said, but you've been doing your research in Kampala. Why don't you bring it down to the local, in, in the villages, in the village, to my parish? And that was something like 50 uh, Kasanaru way. And I took them, I took the soap sculptures, that is the discussions you saw. And the priests were, they, of course, they never came out in, uh, in the group discussion, but they seated, they, they were seated behind. And then they said, after the end, they said, those, yes, those soft sculptures are powerful. You should bring them to the schools. I don't know whether it is the story behind them, but I've never been confronted that I'm talking about taboos and sexualities and vaginas openly. For me, I talk because the disease affected me. And I talk about it through my sculptures and openly. Yeah. No one, no one. If they do, then they are doing it behind my back. So they rugambo, ruma mongaling. <laughs> yeah. Edward accepted me. My daughter said, yes, my parents, my mother said, yeah, you, because I had to seek their consent. If they were okay with me to go public, they all said yes. I had to ask my daughter, Sharon, is it okay? She said, mommy, it's okay. <clears throat> I mean, they're doing important work, aren't they? The symbols, it's not, you know, they're there for a very serious reason. So um, mm. maybe that's why it's it's sort of understood and accepted that, you know, there's a very important intention behind your work. Yeah, yeah. When you have somebody falling sick of HIV AIDS and you see them, how the disease progresses in the on, among their bodies, yeah, you know what it means. You can't see somebody who had flesh on and is dying like a, this dying skeleton. For really, for what? No, we, we have to talk mm. and be open about these issues. Um, we have two, two guests with their hands up. Um, I'm not sure, Angelica, if, we, if we're able to turn on uh, attendees cameras and unmute them so they can speak um uh, uh, yeah it's up to you I can do that um would you like to do that so there's one uh, just uh, they haven't given their name so oh no he's they put their hand down <laughs> okay love um to, I love to talk <laughs> okay, okay. So, um uh Samuel Professor Kasule would you like to um would you like to speak You have to unmute it. Yeah, I've, I've unmuted. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just. Uh, I, um, I must say I enjoy the presentation. It's quite interesting, and uh, very provocative. Uh, I'm aware of her work, of course. And she 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 knows I'm quite aware of her work, and I think that's why I was asking about the roots. Uh, and I think she's asked. Uh, she's eventually answered the question when she said that when she, on reflection, it it looks at the roots as, as they negotiate their way in the ground around stones. And they, that, that kind of um, uh, resonates with the, her life and what she's gone through. And also you do, you do mention that the twisting, which is quite, which is quite good. I think um, when we talk about the twisting and the, 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 the kind of metaphor that she uses, uh, I found that quite exciting. I think um, at the same time, uh, the original person who told her to use roots for her sculptor, uh, uh, we used to call him uh, Musango, Musango, because uh, I knew him, I, I knew the professor of art, that professor of art. I think could have had uh, used a, it could have been double edged just for you to use roots, but also to know that it's the roots which will lead you to, to or which will make you anchored in what you do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kasule. <laughs> wow. Thank you for being around. Okay. Yeah. And I think I'm also powerful because of the Musango also gave me the chance to, to 
to join the School of Fine Arts. And he also gave me a lot of encouragement, but I also had a very good professor, Professor Nagenda, who taught me my masters. And then also I can't forget the good teachers I had in fine art at HSC and Olevo, um, Mrs. Mugambi, Josephine Mukasa, and then there's Miss, uh, Mrs. Lua from Kali Sizo. So I've been fortunate, I've had good teachers and even add on the supervisors and the community at the school of the Newcastle uh, Fine Art Department. They all supported me in, when, when in the work I was doing. They have all supported me, plus the family. I'm just fortunate and I'm grateful. I wonder if, if I could ask a question, please, Lillian. Um, yeah. uh, I mean, on the work that we did together, the project that we worked on, but also this, I think this is something that comes up through all of the, the, the work that you've talked us through tonight, yeah. um, is the question of how, what's the intention of your work? So from, from many angles, you're working uh, in a sort of field of, of health knowledge and a field of, of public health, no? And thinking about education and actually kind of bringing about social change and, and, mm. uh, and, and good health, good public health through your work. Um, but of course, you're also working in this sort of field of academia, uh, you know, teaching in a university and, um, and, you know, working also in kind of gallery practice, also working in contemporary art practice. So I wonder for you, how do those different worlds sit together? Um, and what would you kind of summarise as the main intention of your practice? Who are you speaking to with your work? Well, well, when I'm developing, I think when in the, uh, in the early days of my practice, uh, when I was doing the the masters and after, I was develop, developing beautiful works, art, of course, which is beautiful, and which attracts people to enjoy. But when you have issues. Then when I had issues, and even the issues I've had over the time, I realized that if I'm, a, if I'm an artist, the work has to be meaningful. It gains more value when it is touching on other, on when it is carrying a message through, whether political or social. And then the academia enables you, grounds you to read and find out what others have done. You should not repeat what they have done. Go ahead, go a mile away, an extra mile away from what they produce so that your work can be more richer. Hmm. It is also good to know what others are doing. That is really research. So academia and production are, are very important in the production of artworks, hmm. yeah. Thank you, Lillian. Um, we have one last question um, in our chat box. So I'll come to that unless anyone else has any further ones. So this is from uh, a guest who's not given a name. They say, uh, what has been your most memorable experience as of now and why? So uh, maybe we'll make that the last question and then we'll hand over to Basak. My most memorable? Your most memorable experience as of now and why? It, it was the soft sculptures fighting taboos. Talk openly about issues regarding sex, which we are not talk, talk openly. I can't, I, I couldn't believe at that time when I was holding this soft sculpture, my, my colleague was telling, how can you bring these penises publicly? And I took the soft sculptures, they were embedded with objects, sickness, death, disease. And I put them on the table and waited to hear what these women were going to say. And the women picked up, woo, penises and vaginas. And then that's when I felt relieved. And I said, okay, penises and vaginas, 
How do you relate to the disease? These women were not educated or they were half educated, but they were able to relate to the soft sculptures and the disease, how it had affected them. One of them said, hmm, look at this. Huh? This is how my vagina looked like when it had so many sores. You know, for me, even I had not had, I had not had about this openness publicly. She was not talking alone. There were others around her. For me, that was the, one of the best experiences I've had. And even for Edward, he kept quiet all through. He never said anything, but towards his end of days, he gathered the energy to tell the young men who had come to see him, can you help Lillian? Can you help Lillian? Because the young men kept on asking, oh, when are you going back to Newcastle? And I told them, I cannot go back to Newcastle when Edward is still sick. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that's really powerful the way this, you know, your your work has opened up those conversations that would not have happened otherwise, that openness. Um, yeah. Thank you, Annie. Um, Martha, would you like, do you have any closing remarks before we hand over to Basak um, to just tell us a little bit about the exhibition? Maybe my closing remarks would be, you know, towards um, Lillian's next step, because she she ex she was very clear about, you know, how the experience in, in London, in I mean, in Newcastle for her PhD, was rewarding, and now she just said that she's approaching her retirement and she's kind of preparing for that phase with this new space. Um, which, as you saw, is a very tranquil and uh, and and prospective space, which should allow for dialogue, discussion, residencies, um, even just downtime. Um, so my maybe my last remarks would be towards that um, how you know how she's preparing for that phase to to make that happen because of course as a professor at the university she explained you know how it's energy draining to teach as well as you know keep up her practice actively but now in the next phase she can I think anticipate time uh, once again like she, she had uh, 20 years ago to you know to to think uh, more deliberately but also freely um, to you know maybe make new work or maybe revisit some of the loose ends from the projects she's done yeah so my question my last not really question, but remark would be towards that, that like the new phase, how she's uh, trying to make that happen. Well, I think you're, you're muted, you're Doctor. Muted. Um. It is tough. It is a tough experience for me. Shall we come back to you, Lillian? I'm sorry, that was a difficult question. Perhaps we could move to Basak, um, who will say a few words uh, about Lillian's exhibition, and then we'll come back to Lillian for some closing thoughts, perhaps. Well, I just want to say it has been wonderful to have Dr. Lillian here, the way she can articulate her work and her trajectory and her openness and her vulnerability has been really touching to observe in first hand. And I believe everyone is very emotional at this point in this room. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to say a few words about Almas Art Foundation. We are a fairly new foundation. We've been active since 2022. And we want to highlight and celebrate and champion works of contemporary visual artists from Africa and its diaspora. And we want to include uh, artists who have had impact and resonance to the current production and future production, but who have not been maybe given the platform and the opportunity and the exposure to 
not just show their works, but also have their works recorded, documented through books and publications and films so that future scholars can see them, the public can see them wherever they are in the world. So what Almas does is produce films about these artists and publications and commission writing and commission photographs, commission African uh, artists working in this ecosystem so that we can support the whole ecosystem and support the artists. Uh, so we're very happy to host Dr. Lilian for this showcase, which is in G16, Gallery 16, in the new wing of Somerset House. Please do come by. It's only on till next Sunday. And I would love to have, to, I would love to extend a sincere thanks to SOAS. They have been wonderful. We just called them and said, look, we're hosting this artist. Can you please organize a talk for us? And they're like, of course, we would love to. So thank you so much for your cooperation and your help in this. And I would love to thank Martha because she has been fantastic throughout this whole process. She wrote an essay for us. She uh, curated the works that is going to be included in the publication. And she has been really helpful in encouraging all of us and getting Dr. Lillian to this platform in a way. So thank you all. Thank you to all the participants. And we look forward to seeing you at the exhibition. I believe Dr. Lillian can come back in. Uh, but thank you, everyone. <laughs> uh, you're, you're on mute, Lily. Yeah, Martha has asked, I have, I have, I have challenges. And you know, you are, so you are coming towards retirement. I should be an associate professor, and that means I can continue, continue teaching. But I don't know. I started working on my application it's like before COVID. It is a tough experience. So, and then I remember when I was leaving, I was telling my boss, she says, Your application. I, tell, I told her, Amanda, I've worked on this application before COVID. And when I got COVID, I gave it up. And she says, you have to work on it. I said, yes, when I come back, I'll work on it. But I think what I enjoy most now is to continue developing the work. Teaching, being a professor has a lot of money. So I'm divided, you know, I'm alone. And then the place you've seen Changa is a big space. And one of my professors, Luovi, said, Lillian, you have to, you work, you get, you be well if you are having a, a, as a, an, a professor as well as working as Chanja. But Professor Lubovi doesn't realize that I'm all alone. You're struggling to teach, you're struggling with Chanja. I don't know. I think sometimes I worry a lot. I worry, I've worried. But then I say, God has a way for all of us. I think we know, Lillian, that you have the strengths for um, whichever twist life takes next. Um, and we wish you we wish you luck with it um, and all the best. Um, I'll hand over to uh, Angelica to just say uh, some final words. But thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you so much, Lillian, for this wonderful, uh, incredibly honest um and sensitive exploration of your work it's been really insightful um and thank you so much martha she can hear you but she just coming in. <laughs> okay for coming in as discussant um thank you. and thank you angelica as well no, thank you everybody you thank did. you so much it was a very very emotional and uh, fantastic discussion thank you everybody and um, we look forward to seeing the exhibition and thank you for the audience thank you so much <laughs>